Yeah, I've always spent my career interested in uh, really niche applications of osteopathic manipulation. You know, I think uh, yeah, Dr. Beatty gave me a lot of good advice when I was a fellow. Uh, you know, you, you have, had it's doing a two-year fellowship, and they force you to do a research project. So, Dr. Beatty gave me some advice, and that was really the study that began all of my um, future studies on relating to osteopathic medicine and using osteopathic manipulation. I'm actually not an OMM specialist. I'm, a, I'm an internal medicine specialist, uh, trained at Kirksville, of course, and do know manipulation. So I do get to in, incorporate osteopathic manipulation into my outpatient practice these days. Um, most people are seeing me for hypertension and, and diabetes and their dementia, but uh, I always have a steady stream of people I treat for um, back problems or neck problems. Um, my research has also always been very interested in, as I said, niche applications in the elderly, because that's my area of interest, like how can you use manipulation. Personally, I think uh, manipulation, osteopathic manipulation has a lot of great potential in hospital care for improving uh, immunity and the immune system. Also, manipulation is a great way to mobilize the immobile, because immobility has a huge um, impact on the elderly on hospitalized patients, people in critical care units. So I think there's a, a really an untapped uh, research potential and an untapped clinical potential for manipulation in long-term care or in, in uh, acute care. So some of the, this lecture will, will emphasize that aspect. There we go. So first a little bit of background. You know, Dr. Andrew Taylor still is a very interesting guy. He actually was uh, elderly when he started the first school. You know, he started the first school because he had been practicing for many years, and um, some people just said he had a gift from God. He was just kind of, kind of had this quirky uh, gift, and that he was manipulation was able to heal people. Of course, that was a that was a time when most people had died of infectious diseases, uh, had a lot of chronic illnesses, and there were no effective antibiotics or, or medications were probably more harmful than good. So. He was getting a lot of good results, but the truth is um, he had really spent a lifetime studying uh, anatomy, physiology, uh, and applying what he knew to, with, with the aid of manipulation to treat people. And he had actually become successful after probably 20 years of really practicing and practicing. So I think that's one lesson when we go out and practice, you, you know, the way to get really good at manipulation and using manipulation is just to apply it and use it in your, in your clinical practice. So he started the first school. One of the reasons the doctor still actually did have a lawyer, you don't think about it, but he had a lawyer who drew up the draft, and his comment was when they asked him to draw up the first uh, um, charter for the first school, he said, uh, don't fool yourselves, your father's a gifted man, but when he dies, the system's going to die with him. Of course, he was probably wrong. It's a little graph to show the explosive growth of osteopathic medicine uh, today. This graph is really shows 80,000 practicing DOs. It's actually dated, that was in 2012. Uh, that's, that's over 100,000 right now and more schools. So it makes me a little nervous to see that uh, graph going straight up. Uh, but it, uh, uh, the, the profession has grown quite a bit. And yet uh, uh, most people are probably in the profession are involved in family medicine or different other specialties. My specialty is internal medicine with geriatric emphasis. Uh, those people all can use manipulation. Everyone should learn how to use manipulation. There's a lot of applications. But probably only 2% of the profession is really just strictly specialized in OMM. I gotta make a few comments about evidence-based medicine because the emphasis of this lecture is gonna be on the evidence and what's in the literature, what's in this, what's the science behind it. But I need to throw out a couple definitions of what evidence-based medicine is because uh, these days uh, I think sometimes the term gets, gets abused and I don't think everyone really knows. But really evidence-based medicine is simply the conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of current best evidence in making uh, decisions about clinical care. So basically what it really means that people who invented the term this comes from a guy, uh, article there, you'll see it was published in 1996, but this is, this is a guy, one of the original founders or, or thinkers that, that created the term and what, the, what it really means, but 
basically means it's taking the best studies that you have. Could be a randomized clinical trial, it could be a meta-analysis, but it also could be just um, a survey study or even a, a, a series of case studies, just the best evidence available and trying to apply it to an individual. So evidence-based medicine is not supposed to be cookie-cutter medicine or, or algorithmic medicine or cost-saving medicine, but it's supposed to just taking what we know about things and applying it to an individual. And that's the art of medicine, is how you apply it to an individual. So it doesn't really conflict with Aussie Valley Medicine at all. And um, I wrote an uh, editorial about that uh, that was published there. So <laughs> what is the evidence base for osteopathic manipulative treatment in general? You know, if you go to uh, PubMed and you do a search, you do a search where you um, uh, use the word osteopathic, you'll get a lot of hits. Now that would be hits for articles that were actually from an osteopathic institution or somebody was an osteopathic doctor, so you get a lot of hits. But when you limit it to clinical trials, you'll get quite a few. And then when you just, but that could be a clinical trial on anything. It may not even be related to osteopathic medicine. It was just done at an osteopathic institution or hospital. If you just limit it to osteopathic in the title, which actually in this case probably covers 98% or 95% of all osteopathic studies, uh, you're only going to get 98 hits for a 51-year period. So that's really the base, the evidence base, or the clinical trial base, which is, and some of these are just um, student projects and, and small projects, so, but they're still considered clinical trials. Just say I did the same thing for chiropractic, and it got about the same number of, about 100 studies for them. So we don't have a huge base, and most of the research done in osteopathic medicine has actually been done since the year 2000. This was a, a graph I put together. I just went through the JOA, and I went to this other art, uh, journal, the Osteopathic Medicine and Primary Care. You can find that, art, that journal online. It stopped publishing in, in uh, 2011, but uh, it's still, the articles are still online. I have a couple of papers published there. It's an online journal on PubMed. But uh, most of the research or clinical trials, hard, you know, evidence, you know, of a trial of osteopathic manipulative treatment, but most of it's been done in the past, um, since the year 2000. All right. Before we got started, I wanted, I was thinking about general med. <laughs> I didn't know about John Lewis's book. Uh, this was the, the previous uh, biography of Andrew Taylor Still, if you're ever interested in, in his life and stuff. Uh, certainly, it covers, uh, you know, his, from his mother's side, the, most of his family lived in Virginia, were mostly wiped out by uh, Indians, and uh, his pro-slavery days, and the origins of osteopathic medicine, uh, spirituality, evolution, every thought, you know, structure uh, and function are typically related, those are evolutionary ideas. So, um, but it's an interesting book and shows uh, how osteopathic medicine Developed and for, certainly, Dr. Still developed a pr, uh, philosophy of medicine which was very individualized. Uh, he never could bring himself to, you know, bring a standardized book of treatments because he was really a believer in individualizing your treatment to the patient. It's another interesting book. Um, if you can read, you can probably get it. A historical book is out of print. But a lot of, uh, if you ever want to know how Dr. Still practiced in his style of practice and how he practiced, uh, there's a lot of firsthand accounts of what he did and his treatment style. And getting back to the theme of osteopathic treatment in the hospital, this uh, book covers probably the first uh, real clinical trial of osteopathic medicine in the hospital. And basically, um, well, the whole book covers the osteopathic merger and the background behind it and the California history of, uh, of, history of osteopathic medicine in California and how the merger came about and who the characters were. But there is a chapter on the, uh, one of the first studies. And basically, the Los Angeles General Hospital, they had uh, segregated units, right? So the, uh, the DOs could practice over here and the MDs could practice in the larger part of the hospital. And uh, this gentleman, uh, published uh, some of the findings, and 
basically, the short end, the, they had shorter length of stays and better outcomes. It also came out, there's a historical, a student paper published in the DO a few years ago that goes into this more, in more detail. But basically, the, the, they had really good outcomes. And then they had such good outcomes that after they published this data, uh, the, the, peop, the powers that be at the hospitals uh, stopped, stopped uh, them, letting them collect data separately. So other early studies, there was a, in the 1930s, there was a professor and student uh, research pair uh, that studied use of splenic pumps. Does splenic pumping actually improve the immune system? At that time, they had a lot of people in the hospital for uh, things like abscesses and tularemia and, and all kinds of infectious related things and antibiotics were really in their infancy. So they studied, uh, on 100 normal patients, the first, the first study was 100 normal pa uh, students, basically there were students they tried it out on, and then the next was a series of 100 hospitalized patients where they did splenic pumping, and they did, uh, they basically took a CBC or blood count before, did the splenic pumping, and then measured it later. Um, but they published all the raw data in their paper. You know, they didn't use what we would consider scientifically valid. You know, they didn't do means and stuff. Their, their statistical methods were pretty primitive. But they published all the raw data in the papers. And what I did in, uh, published in 2005 and then in 2008 was an analysis of the raw data. And this, these graphs come from the second study uh, which basically shows that the white counts really did increase uh, in their patients postoperatively. And as you might think, they're messing with the spleen. The spleen sequesters the red blood cells. And the red blood cells actually did decrease statistically. And they have something called the Arnath index, which is really your, your, it's a left shift or a right shift. Basically, their Arnath index showed a a decrease, which would really mean that when they were doing the splenic pump, they were, they were releasing white blood cells, mature white blood cells that were sequestered in the spleen into the, into the um, circulatory system. Okay. But what's most interesting about this, they did a series of immunologic tests where they did something called a phagocytic index and an opsonic index. These are basically how many, uh, how many uh, bacteria the, the white cells can phagos phagocytes eat up in, in, and um, bacteriolytic power. They did, these are basically a series of immune, immunologic studies in, 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 the, um, in the lab, and they showed, uh, high, they were all highly significant for splenic pumping. But you know, it's not a randomized study. Uh, if you read the first paper, there was a group of uh, enthusiastic honorary fraternity students who did some of the data collection in there. Their data was far better than, uh, than uh, the other uh, stuff done by the, by the researchers. So there's a potential for bias, because it's not really, and then they had a very complicated study design, which you would never use today. So we did try, I did try when I was in Kirksville, we had 100 students, and we did the same kind of study, uh, but it was a largely a uh, negative study. I don't know if that's because the students are a lot more mobile and, and active and, you know, do basically when they go jogging and move around, they, they have really good mobility. But it was a pretty much a negative study. I wasn't able to repeat it. There is the Klein study. This is one of the most, this is one of the uh, first of the modern studies. It's kind of in a transition period. It was done in the very early 1960s by a pediatrician uh, named Dr. Klein, and I think he did it at Kirksville, and a lot of pediatric cases. It's a very interesting study in that there's not really a control group, but it's the only study where you're gonna see OMT alone versus antibiotics alone versus OMT and, uh, and antibiotics. So they actually had people in the study who didn't get any antibiotic therapy, which is something you would probably wouldn't be able to do today. Antibiotics were still relatively young. And uh, the red lines are the most interesting, the kids who had pneumonia, uh, you know, OMT, they had the longer length of stay, but uh, who didn't get antibiotics. They got antibiotics that were a little better, but when you combined them, they had the, the best outcome when you did OMT plus antibiotic therapy. 
So when I was a... This last slide is uh, interesting. You guys want to know about... I think this is the only, the only data I know that proves what I think we all know. In, in the 1950s and 60s, a lot of deals were doing manipulation. I remember hearing stories about the students <coughs> all doing rib raising on all the hospitalized patients and, and things like that, but it's really declined over, over those decades. And this is the only study which was published actually in an abstract form at a, at a conference by a, a Dr. John Lynch. He's, um, he's at the NIH. But basically all he did, and, and any of the students could do that today, is he went to the hospital database where they got, you know, uh, there's a national database of all the hospital discharges and he looked for, you know, some act dysfunction codes and he collected them. And basically, his, he showed that throughout the 1990s, over a 10-year period, uh, OMT was, you know, in the decline. Really don't know if it's in decline today with, with the expansion of the profession and, and more research that's been done since then. It's not known. but it, Showed that OMT. You ever wanted to know how much OMT was done? But it was those are rates per 100,000 discharges. So, not that often. It actually was most often done, according to his research, in small midwestern hospitals. All right. So this brings us up to more modern times. When I was a fellow. Uh, they had to do a, a pilot study, and then um, when I was in Texas, we did a larger randomized control trial. It was a study, uh, both were funded by the AOA. And then uh, while I was in Kirksville, we did the multi-center, the multi-center osteopathic pneumonia study in the elderly. And uh, literally this, just this fall, I published a, a subgroup analysis of the paper of that study. So, you know, you know pneumonia is like the classic non musculoskeletal application for, for OMT. It always has been. Uh, you know, originally, philosophically, you know, OMT was actually developed at a time when most people died from infectious diseases. And a lot of the techniques that were developed originally were for pneumonia. You know, you may not know it, but the lymphatic pump was invented for pneumonia. Uh, rib raising was invented for the rib raising. It was actually invented for pneumonia. So at the time, you know, there's a, there's a book by Lane it was, a, it was a pathologist at Kirksville, but he basically talks about, you know, looking, trying to find ways to improve um, host defense. And, you know, the early DOs were fine, trying to find ways to improve host defense. The MDs were all looking for the, the magic bullet, bullet, which turned out to be antibiotics eventually. Okay? So when I developed the uh, MOPSI protocol or the pneumonia protocol, Basically, there were dozens and dozens of articles about how I treat pneumonia from the turn of the century, where people would write in. Believe it or not, there used to be six, seven different osteopathic journals that people would write in. I practitioners would write in and tell people how they practiced. So we have these uh, techniques, and it's a 15-minute duration, twice, twice a day frequency uh, protocol, and we developed this light touch sham treatment. Um, to go with it. And you're familiar with these. This is uh, uh, one of my students at the Texas study. He's treating a guy in the ICU. He's doing the paraspinal muscle innovation and soft tissue there. He does that bilaterally. Then he does the classic rib raising, which is a pretty cool technique and can be done in the hospital. It's not that hard. Uh, we would do the redoming of the diaphragm. Uh, we use this myofascial techniques. Uh, then they would go up to the neck. Some of the order might change, but uh, we would do soft tissue on the neck and, and uh, condylar decompression. Myofascial release on the neck. And then uh, the thoracic lymphatic pump. And we would do the, the type of the thoracic lymphatic pump with activation, you know, where you do the repetitive motion, then you take your hands off quickly. You're all familiar with that. And the air rushes in. It's a great, great technique, I think, for. Um, at, for relieving or reversing atelectasis. And because I like it so much, we would, we would do the pedal pump at the end, get the circulation moving around. And this was my first study. It's only 21 people, so kind of like a pilot study. None of these, the only ones that are statistically significant were the PO antibiotics at the end. 
Uh, but it just suggests we are getting them onto PO antibiotics before they're discharged a little faster. Uh, as you see, the, the trend for all of those, how long they're on antibiotics, how long they're in the hospital, were, were favorable for the treatment. And like touch, it's just lightly touching the body for the same duration, for the same amount of time, um, and in the same areas, as, uh, but not really trying to move fascial structures or joints and stuff. So there's a sham control for this. Uh, I did a single site study in Texas, and this was the, had the very good results. Uh, it had the same pattern, same pattern, only larger numbers, and they were highly significant. The length of hospital stay was much reduced, much reduced. And then, uh, so that gave us the, the data to do the multicenter osteopathic pneumonia study in the elderly, which is a $1.5 million study. Uh, it was funded by a number of osteopathic foundations, which were really, um, you know, when these osteopathic uh, hospitals were sold to bigger corporations, they usually put aside a pot of money for a foundation. And so it was a conglomerate of, uh, led by the Ohio Osteopathic Foundation, um, Heritage Foundation, um, they pulled all their funds together and they, they, they funded this uh, very large study. It was coordinated through the um, Osteopathic Research Center in Texas, and of course I was at Kirksville, so we, we did the day-to-day uh, -day administration, and uh, we had uh, hospitals in New Jersey, Texas, Missouri, Michigan, and Ohio participate. So it's a randomized control trial. It's a true randomized control trial where you, know, you don't know what, which one of the three groups are gonna be in when you sign up for the study. Um, it's a seamless design in that we didn't specify to the doctors what kind of antibiotics they were going to be in or how to run it or when, to, when they should be discharged. So it just is a, was designed to, to run in the background with, without interfering with the day-to-day -day, uh, decisions that the hospitalists or the, the attending or the house staff even uh, would make. And it's a blinded study in that the decision makers as to how long you're on antibiotics and what antibiotics and how long you're going to stay in the hospital all those folks are blinded to what's, what group you're in. And it's a three-arm study because people always, you know, say, well, you know, OMT is just as good as light touch and light touch just, you know, was it the light touch or was it the touch or was it the no treatment? And so there's, a, there's an OMT group, a light touch group, and a conventional care only group, which the conventional care only group just doesn't get any extra attention or touch. So a study like this, uh, we screened, the way you'd screen for it is just to, to find out who was admitted in the morning to your hospital. Go, you know, we have a research coordinator go to the admissions office or, or scan the admissions, look for a potential case. So they screened over 3,000 people. Some of them may just have chest pain or pleuritis or bronchitis, but um, then they'd go through a pretty rigorous uh, criteria for actually having acute pneumonia. So in the end, you, we ended up with 406 randomized individuals. And this is the primary outcome. It's a little complicated because there's two kinds of data analysis which are important to know, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with the difference between per protocol analysis or I tension to treat analysis. Now, most studies actu in actuality and I have a paper that studied this that actually took randomized 100 studies and looked at them. Most, probably 80% of the studies out there, maybe 90%, are actually for protocol analysis, even if they might say they're, I intend to treat. But for protocol analysis means um, the results are based on uh, actually getting the treatment. So those are the people who follow the protocol. Intent to treat analysis is, is when you enroll in a study and uh, then your, your outcomes are, 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 are part of the analysis. So if, if uh, Mr. Smith enrolls in the study and uh, then the following morning he decides to drop out of the study, he's still, his data is still in the study, which, which really screws up your data because he never got any treatments, but he's still in the study analysis which is kind of shows that if you can find, it's harder to find a difference, and if you find a difference, it's more robust. It's a little more 
applicable to day-to-day -day life because people do sign up for treatments and then they don't comply or they miss treatments. So in that sense, it's a little more generalizable, while per protocol, per protocol analysis is really uh, uh, looking at what the, what the treatment actually does if they actually get it. So there are pros and cons. But so long and short saying, the, uh, uh, for the most part, the per protocol analysis in MOPSIs were positive, showed that if the patients actually got the treatment, they uh, benefited. Uh, and again, this is length of stay, uh, only four days for uh, the OMT group, 4.4 days for the light touch and 4.5 days. And you see this pattern in MOPSI and these and many other three group analysis studies where you got a group in a light touch group in the middle where for some weird reason a light touch often falls in between the no treatment and the and the OMT. You'll see light touch often fall in the middle. And that becomes sometimes controversial to ex explain. The other thing about MOPSI so our hospital care system has really changed. It's amazing. It's amazing. But when I did the um, pilot study in 92 and 93, the average length of stay in the hospital was really was about, nationally was about 14 days. People went to the hospital and if they had pneumonia, on average, they would stay there almost about two weeks. And it's huge sea changes happen. When I did the Texas study, not that long, the national average was around eight days when the MOPSI data or the pneumonia studies reflected very closely. And when, when we did MOPSI, the average length of stay it really is about 4.5 days. So what that really means is that the, the impact of your treatment, it gets, it gets harder and harder to show difference because, because uh, any, any therapy you, you, you do, you have to have a duration of effect. Like you wouldn't expect an antibiotic to fix somebody pneumonia in one dose. You have to have a certain threshold of doses. So it gets harder and harder to show a difference if your length, of, if you, when your length of stay is shorter. So if you find niches where you can use OMT for longer periods of time, have a more an accumulative effect, I think you'd see a bigger difference um, in its outcomes, you know, like in the ICU unit or in long-term care or other, or, or other settings or potential for outpatient settings. All right, so that's, if you're all interested there, I recently published the MOPSI subgroup analysis, where we looked at subgroup analysis. And that paper's published in the JOA this September. It's a bit of a complicated study. It was a very hard to write that paper. We went through all kinds of harrowing experiences trying to write that paper and get it published. Um, partly because it's kind of complex, because it's, it's, a, it's a subgroup analysis, right? So you're, you know, you already have three arms, and you have two types of analysis, which I'll never do again, and um, then you have the subgroup. So it's a little bit complicated, but if you read through the paper, the bottom line is what the paper clearly shows that if you're between the age of 50 and 75, and um, you have pneumonia, then OMT gets you out of the hospital faster. But if you're over the age of 75 and you're in the hospital for pneumonia and you get OMT, you're, you're less likely to die. And that's, it's, it's, it shows that very really clearly. Or if you're, uh, what's a little bit of a, of, a, of a wrench into that is also that applied a little less dramatically, but it also applied to light touch. If you got the light touch group, you were actually less likely to die. And uh, if you were very, very sick, if you had a pneumonia severity index of five, which is, I think that's the second highest or highest, and you got OMT, you definitely uh, reduced your risk of dying because that was by the, intent, the harder intent to treat analysis. So, so pneumonia, you know, OMT has a potential. One of OMT has a potential in the hospital. One of the big challenges is just that the hospital length of stay has gotten so shorter that's going to be harder to, to show a bigger difference. What about basic uh, studies? This is an interesting paper. Not done by me, it was done by Lisa Hodge at the Texas and her associates, but they took rats, right? And they, they had a syringe full of uh, pneumococcal, 
pneumonia bacteria, and they squirted it down their nose, and then they um, gave them either OMT or they gave OMT with a, a, a treatment. Basically, after 36, they uh, sacrificed the animals at certain time periods and blended up their, their um, spleens and their lungs and, and grew out the bacteria colony and counted them. But basically, uh, no, no rats had any bacteria in their spleens, but they did have some bacteria in the lungs that were left over. And at uh, 96 hours, if they got OMT, um, there was a small group of rats who got the OMT, but nothing else compared to the other two treatments that still had some, that were totally cleared of, of bacteria in the, in, the, in the lungs. So now if they got antibiotics, what you see there on the left is they got um, the OMT. If they got lymphatic pump, then 63% of them cleared, totally cleared the uh, bacteria from their lungs. If they got sham, which was kind of a light touch treatment, it was in the middle, and then if they got no treatment at all, 25% of them still had some bacteria in the lungs if they just got the antibiotics. So it was just clear evidence that antibiotics and OMT, OMT has a, has a boosting or, or a, uh, effect on antibiotic therapy. Okay. That's other related studies. These are some interesting studies for the hospital that are important to know. Some of them are a little bit older. But uh, this is the classic one, uh, post-cholecystectomy prevents atelectasis. Uh, this was in the days when they did uh, uh, the, the big scar. They didn't do it laparoscopically. These were all uh, more traditional cholecystectomy patients. But uh, post-operatively, uh, they did a lymphatic pump treatment, but they didn't do it with activation. They just took their hands off slowly, but they did a single thing. And uh, kind of low-risk patients, but uh, in the end, their uh, force vital capacities were uh, much better, improved much faster in the OMT group than incentive spirometry, which is the traditional treatment. So OMT, you know, would have a potential in postoperative patients uh, in preventing atelectasis. Probably work as well or better than uh, incentive spirometry. This is a great study. This is one of the best studies ever done. Although it's very small, it's, it's, it's done well and it was on pancreatitis and OMT. And I'm just always amazed that they got, uh, you know, I practice in the hospital, you don't see people with pancreatitis every day, so I'm just so impressed that they got six people in an OMT group and eight people in a control group who had acute pancreatitis, and they, they, they did the uh, either OMT or, or just usual care. And it did, it, it reduced the length of stay by, by about half, actually. And this was done in 1998, so that's when length of stays were a little longer. But I always think that's an impressive study. There's a series, a case series by a guy named Herman when he was, a, when he was just a resident. And uh, he found evidence that uh, uh, using OMT prevented postoperative ileus. This is just where they went in and they did uh, paraspinal inhibition after surgery. Uh, fairly frequently, according to this, uh, every two hours, but for just two minutes, and uh, dramatically reduced the cases of, of um, ileus. It's really a consecutive study, so they took a series of 317 people, and they looked at them, and then they did a bunch without doing the, the OMT. So it's not a side-by-side -side comparison. There could be group differences. Uh, it's mostly an observational study. Somebody repeated this uh, study. It's still an observational study. It's not really a ran it's not really a controlled clinical trial, but it's a, a like an observational study, a case case study where it's 17 people who got OMT and uh, 38 people who didn't, and it showed uh, also very positive results in, as far as uh, shortening ileus and reducing it. It's a nice study, nice place to start. Um, gosh. A few things, I'm actually, my current project is going to be uh, falls. I'm mostly doing outpatient stuff, but falls is an enormous cause of hospitalizations um, in the elderly. Uh, a lot of people go to, the, go to the hospital every year because they fell and they broke their hip and stuff. It's a huge problem in the elderly. It's probably, the, it is the leading cause of death in the elderly from accidents is, is falls uh, by far. 
So we've done doing some research now uh, whether falls, if you can use OMT to improve people's balance. Uh, usually these are very general techniques to improve mobility from the, from the head down to the uh, toe. Things that do work uh, is always to find the cause, the osteopathic philosophy of finding the cause, treat the cause is very important. Uh, it's very important to review the medicines, of course. Vitamin D actually does help. Physical th therapy helps uh, certainly in training people to use the de devices. One thing that works most is uh, exercise. If you can get people to exercise, you can reduce their falls by strengthening them. But one of the problems with exercise is it takes a huge amount of exercise. And many, in some studies, it takes uh, you know, half a year, actually sometimes two years, to show a, a big difference. So. The dose is a big problem. So I was working with some uh, physiologists where they have an exercise, do a bicycling protocol where the people do cycling in place, and then we're going to study cycling plus OMT to see if that reduces uh, falls and see if uh, the OMT improves the cycling uh, protocol. So we'll have one group that gets OMT, one group that gets uh, cycling, and one group that gets both. And that's my rate is, I mean, we'll, that's under review now. I don't know if we'll get funded for it, but we'll see. I do have a little bit of data. This is somebody who had OMT. This is called a, uh, this is, they're on a force plate machine where they walk, it's a six foot force plate. So they're walking across this thing, taking a step, turning around and coming back, and they do that three times. And uh, this is their scores before OMT. And then they just had one session, and uh, ah, why did I turn it off? There we go. All right, that's before OMT, that's after. So, so they're 76% below normal, they're only 39%, they're 76%, 30%. So, and, and if you notice, there's, there's more symmetry down here mm, when they turn. Uh, that goes away. There we go, it's a lot better. So. This is just one treatment and just over their all balance. We have some other data that shows that their overall balance is better if they get OMT. So it's an interesting area of, to explore. Also there's some interesting studies of Parkinson's disease and improving mo gait mobility and stuff. That's, that's some projects that are ongoing right now. So final thoughts, I, I have a paper on uh, osteopathic axioms Basically, I think even if you don't use manipulation, there's a lot of ideas in osteopathic medicine. Uh, certainly the find it, fix it, and leave it alone is, a very, is one of the things. But these are just short sayings that I think they, they kind of make your clinical practice a lot more effective. Um, commonly used by Still and really others, uh, kind of a unique aspect of our heritage. Uh, this paper that I talked about talked about examples of, of axioms, uh, we explored find it, fix it, and leave it alone, where it came from and what it really means. But basically finding the problem, you know, trying to, to fix it, but also get, fi leaving it alone, giving it time for it to, your own body to heal itself. You can over-treat people, you know, everything has a therapeutic time for you to respond. Um, treat what you find is a very interesting axiom. Uh, Dr. Still would come up and give a lecture and he'd start writing, drawing a drawing a, a pig, so I'm going to draw a pig, and then he'd start drawing it up on the board, and it would turn into a, a turkey by the time he was um, done with the drawing, and he's, you know, then he would give him a lecture about, you know, how many of you guys are going to diagnose a pig when it turns out to be a turkey? Always remember that, you know, when you go see the patient, you know, don't take just somebody else's word for it. You see the patient, then, then you, you know, you treat what you actually find, you know, not what somebody tell you, tell you you're going to find and stuff. And, um, and then we added an axiom. Uh, this was an axiom from Dr. Gutensohn, uh, who's a famous guy in Kirksville. He's a, well known for being a diagnostician. There's a Gutensohn Dinzo Award named after him. But basically, if you listen to your patients long enough, then you will find the diagnosis, you know. Getting them to talk, getting them to talk about, you know, their family, or just listening to them. You'll, if you listen to them long enough, you'll, uh, they'll tell you what's wrong with them. And then the last axiom that we talked about it, Dr. Um, Cavalier and I uh, coined, was just whenever you have a new patient with a problem, just be sure you um, 
look at their medicines. Always look at the medicines because the medicines often cause a problem. You know, if they got a new problem, even if they've been on the medicine for a long time, uh, they can still develop an adverse effect from it uh, because their body's always changing. It's often overlooked. So, aren't you bound on time? That's really, it's a lot of slides to cover. We have 10 minutes or so for questions. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think uh, John Luchadone is the head of the uh, Osteopathic Research Center. I've been looking at their websites a lot, and I haven't seen a change in the past uh, uh, couple years or so. So I don't know how active they are. I know it's the home of Lisa Hodge who's doing a lot of this lymphatic stuff, which is, I think, really exciting. Uh, if I understand it right, they, they just had a rat and they were just uh, squeezing the thoracic cage back and forth just between their hands, like this, to get it, to, which gets the diaphragm move. It's, 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 and the, the rat is actually, if anybody wonders, is anesthetized while they do that, so it's a, a sleeping rat. Uh, the interesting thing about that, huh? Is that called a rat a two maneuver? Yeah, I think it, it could be. You know, the very, what I thought most interesting about that study was, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're squirting pneumococcal bacteria down their noses, and they're aspirating, the poor rats are aspirating, but none of the rats actually got sick. I think rats have a really good immune system, so, but, uh, other questions that I'm looking for. One, I, I wanted to ask you other techniques that you use, I think, in geriatric population, diarrhea, constipation, uh, and some of the logical stuff. Yeah, I've used uh, some of it. Uh, and for constipation, a few times in the hospital where we did paraspinal inhibition for somebody. There's, there was a, uh, she was actually a retired um, psychiatrist uh, from our department who was in the hospital for constipation. And so I gave her uh, paraspinal muscle inhibition and she got her to move her bowels. Uh, as far as techniques, I use a lot of uh, mild techniques. Actually, one of my favorite techniques for the cervical spine is this, this stills technique. I think you get a lot of good, good uh, mobilization and treat the cervical spine a lot. I use a lot in the office. I use a lot of uh, some of these uh, articulatory techniques and uh, stills technique. And yet, uh, I would still do HVLA in some of these uh, seniors, you know, especially seniors who are used to HVLA if, if, if it's selected right. Really not that afraid of using HVLA. You think you have to be careful and really localize in a very gentle way, but I can I don't really have any contraindications for specific techniques. Do I have a question? Yeah, I was wondering about the, the change in hospital duration. Hospital yeah. duration. Was that because of the attempts to get people out faster? Oh yeah, it's all because of the it's all because of the diag the it's the it's a huge the diagnostic related groups are capitated prospective payment system, you know, the hospitals uh, get more money if you get out of the hospital faster. So yeah, it's all because of that payment system. And it's taken 20 years for it to fully, you know, it didn't affect it right away, but you can see how it's really dramatically reduced. So, and that's an enormous impact as to, you know, when you, when you think about OMT, you got you know, if somebody's admitted to the hospital, they're going to be discharged. I mean, it takes you maybe 24 hours for the first OMT session to get there. You know, by the time someone's admitted, you know, at night and then the consult goes through and somebody gets there at bedside, it could be, could be almost a day. So, and if they're only there three days, they may get two or three treatments, you know. So that affects the, the, the modality of the treatment, but the big impact. Yeah. They were in 95, they're just being sent home sicker. Oh yeah, people are going home sicker, yeah. They're, well, a lot of times they're, they're just as sick. Yeah, medicine didn't get better. They're, they're all going to subacute care, right? right? So a lot of times those people who would just stay in the hospital, they're discharged to uh, subacute care in our, our region where they, they continue their recovery. And they continue their antibiotic therapy typically, but it's, it's harder to, to coordinate like an OMT treatment for them, you know at the, those facilities. Just one more follow-up. Sure. Uh, 
what if, <clears throat> from a research design standpoint, what would be the cost barriers that, that you could guess um, in, in, if you haven't looked at it to following up after they've left the hospital? Oh, you mean like, like following their assessment? Yeah, how long were they sick total in total? Uh, the, we did a few things. We did some follow-up with the MOPSI study. Uh, one was time to clinical stability. There was some follow-up measures. Those weren't that dramatically different, though, in the study. So we did a f tried to do a few things to try to assess how they did afterwards. But um, yeah, that's, that takes more resources and stuff to, to follow up on the call. Have you ever looked at potential differences between male and female patients with your treatments? Oh yeah, I think we did look at that. I don't think those, when we did the subgroup analysis, I think our statistician looked at male and female differences, but I don't think they saw any that were, you know, or we would have published it. But <laughs> uh, no, I don't think there were. There was a. <laughs> so yeah, I wanted to do this. Yeah, the backstory, you know, I wanted to do the subgroup analysis in, in the, like several papers, but I think the other people on the project were just wanting to, you know, put it all into one paper, so we had to cram everything. So I did, wasn't able to publish all the, like, some of the negative data and stuff. I think it would be a great thing to investigate because of differences in gender and attitudes and many other things. Another one? Okay. So have you been following the procalcitonin levels being reduced at, as a measure for antibiotics, and do you think that could be used in the study efficiently? Oh yeah, you mean like... Um, antibiotics Yeah, no, that's... Oh, well, the study that came out about a week or two ago, wasn't it? Yeah, our, our, in our area, I know the ER departments really do use that procalcitonin. Now when we did MOPSI, we, you know, uh, the procalcitonin thing wasn't in common use, so it's not part of MOPSI, but it could be used in a study design, especially, you know, the big challenge really is, is do you have, have people have pneumonia? I mean, our, our criteria was primarily a chest X-ray, which, which is today, you know, the criteria, you know, for pneumonia would have to be a little bit different and stuff. So if you did future, future studies, you'd, you might want to look at calcitonin and all that stuff, so. Because, yeah, they're really using it a lot these days, whether somebody should be on antibiotics or not. Thank you, Dr. Miller. All right, thanks.